Welcome to this message coming to you from Free School Court Church, Bridgend, South Wales in the United Kingdom. It's great to have you joining. I'm really thrilled that you are watching this message. I'm especially pleased that you're watching this one because this is the last message, the last Sunday message, which I shall be giving as the pastor of our church. The reason for that is as follows. I'm due to retire. This message is going out on YouTube for the first time on the 26th of July 2020 and I am due to retire at the end of August. But August has been blocked off for holiday and so this is the last Sunday message which I shall be giving as the pastor of our church having been here for the last 22 years. So I'm really glad that you've joined. And it's appropriate, really, that in this message we come to the end of a series of studies I've been doing on what is called the Lord's Prayer, that prayer which Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray. He gave it to them as a pattern to help them in their prayer life. And it's appropriate, it seems to me, to be ending my uh, ministry here speaking about prayer. Because we begin the Christian life by prayer. You may just be watching this. You may not be a real disciple of Jesus Christ. You may not be a Christian in the Bible sense of the word. How do you become one? Well, it begins with prayer. By asking God to be merciful to you, a sinner. By asking Jesus Christ to receive you and trusting yourself to him. We begin in prayer. We continue as Christians by praying day by day and we shall need to pray as we come to the end of our Christian life. In fact, as I said in the previous message which went out on YouTube earlier uh, today, the very first message I preached as pastor of our church was on the subject of prayer. So it seems to me it's singularly appropriate that we're coming tonight and we're ending the series on the Lord's Prayer. I didn't plan it that way. It has just wonderfully worked out that here we are at the end of this series of studies. And we're coming in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13 to the last uh, two requests. They're really two sides of the same coin, but you can see them as two requests. Um, there in Matthew 6, 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I say that's the end of the prayer. Some Bibles have at the end of that uh, request the words, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And other Bibles don't have those words. And the reason is that amongst the Greek manuscripts from which our Bibles are translated, uh, the best manuscripts don't have those last words. And they probably crept in simply as, as a result of the early church in the early centuries uh, when they, they prayed together publicly on a Sunday, those words were added as part of the ending of the prayer, and somehow then somebody copied them into the uh, some of the Greek manuscripts. But the best ones don't have those words. So we come to the end of the prayer now. Uh, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now in the previous message, which went out earlier today, I said that the request, Lead us not into temptation, has three aspects to it. And I looked at two in the previous message, and I'm going to look at the third in this message. But if you didn't see that earlier message, let me very, very briefly summarise what I had to say. And what I said of two aspects there uh, was as follows. First of all, it refers to a request that God wouldn't test us. We know that God does test people. He purifies his people in that way. But as I pointed out, Although that is so, it's not wrong to pray that we won't be tested. So Jesus Christ said that uh, there would be wars and rumours of wars. And yet the Bible also says that it's right for us to pray that we have peace. Again, Jesus Christ made it clear that his disciples would face persecution. And yet he told them to take steps to avoid persecution as well. So it's not wrong to pray that God won't test us. And then the second aspect is this, that God may test us. And give us grace to bear that temptation but that being so we have to pray that we won't then be tempted either by our own hearts the evil that's there or more particularly 
be tempted by Satan, the devil, that God wouldn't give him permission when we are tested to be tempted uh, to sin. So that's just a little uh, brief summary of what I said this morning. Now I want to come to the, uh, the third aspect of this. And the third aspect of this request is as follows. We're really asking uh, God, our Heavenly Father, cause us not to be overcome by temptation. Cause us not, as a result of temptation, to fall into sin. Cause us not to succumb to temptation by sinning. Now, there's a very godly Scottish Christian who died some years ago, I think about five years ago, um, his name was Howard Marshall. He was a professor up in Aberdeen. He was one of the world's leading New Testament scholars and a very fine uh, scholar and very fine in his understanding of Greek. And Professor Marshall, in commenting on this particular request, as it's found in the Gospel of Luke, we're looking at it in Matthew, but it also occurs in Luke's Gospel, he had uh, turned up some Jewish writings of the same period and he demonstrates that the, the force therefore of this request is really cause us not to succumb to temptation cause us not to fall into sin when we are tempted and it seems to me that at that point we have drilled right down to the real bedrock core meaning of this request. So we, we pray we don't want to be tested but although we take, pray that we may be tested. Very well we pray that if that is so we won't be tempted to sin but we may be and God may grant the devil permission to tempt us to sin so now we pray that we won't yield to that temptation that we won't give in to it and sin. In fact, we can drill down just a little bit further because I think it, it also carries the idea cause us not to fall away. Because in his well-known story that's known as the parable of the sower, as it's recorded in Luke's Gospel, Jesus speaks of some people who hear the, uh, the message of God's kingdom, they immediately receive it with joy they, they, they are like a plant that springs up, but then it withers. And Jesus explains that such people are those who, when temptation or testing comes, they fall away. Here then is a request that we won't fall away. You may be asking yourself at that point, does this preacher believe that a person can be a true Christian? and fall away and lose his salvation. No, I don't believe that. I believe that the Bible teaches that those who are truly saved will be given grace by God to persevere right until the very end. But there is another strand of Bible teaching that we need to weave into that, and I want to do that before I finish this message. Before I draw some practical lessons then from that first point that we're asking God to cause us not to be overcome by temptation, we need to go on and secondly look at the very last part of the verse, but deliver us from evil. Every single word in that request is of huge importance and significance. The first word, but. It's a word that marks a strong contrast. This is why I say, although it's two requests, they're really two sides of the same coin. Because what we are praying is this, lead us not into temptation, but rather, instead, on the other hand, deliver us from evil. And that but shows it's been joined to the earlier request. Deliver. Now that word translated deliver, um, it can carry a number of ideas. It, it can mean preserve. So here is someone in a time of trial, preserve me, keep me, hold me, hold me in that situation. But it can also uh, refer, and it often does refer in the Bible, to being taken out of the situation, being delivered. How are we to understand it here? Well, 
we need to look at the very last uh, part of the verse. But deliver us from... Now, the Bible that I use, uh, the New International Version, says deliver us from the evil one. Other Bible translations, the old uh, authorised version, or King James Version, renders it, but deliver us from evil. Obviously, th those are two quite different ideas. They're not entirely unrelated, but they are different. Uh, let me explain. If it means deliver us from evil, that, that covers a whole range of things. Yes, it includes the evil one, the devil, but it's not confined to the devil, is it? If, however, it means deliver us from the evil one, that's very specific. Uh, that, that's not referring to other evils, nor don't we need to be delivered from them and preserved from them. But if it means the evil one here, then this is a very specific request that we be preserved, we be delivered from the devil himself. Now, which is it? Well, there are two words in Greek for which are translated um, from, deliver us from. And at this point, again, I'm heavily indebted to a great Canadian uh, scholar, Bible teacher and preacher, Professor Don Carson, who, commenting on this verse, refers to a study that had been carried out, and uh, which demonstrates that when the one word, from, is used in connection, in association with this word, deliver, it always means deliverance from things not from people. And if that word were used here, it would mean deliver us from evil in a general sense. But this study goes on to look at the other word that's translated from, the word that is used here in Matthew chapter 6, and predominantly when that word is used, it refers to being delivered from a person. And that being so, and for other reasons that I, I haven't got time to go into tonight, it seems to me that those translations are right which render it deliver us from the evil one. This then is a prayer that we be delivered from Satan himself. So here is the request, O God, O Heavenly Father, uh, keep us from being tested. But if we are tested, O God, uh, keep us from being tempted to sin especially by the devil. But, O oh God, our Heavenly Father, if Satan does tempt us to sin, keep us from succumbing, cause us to stand, so that we won't succumb to that temptation. If we do, O oh God, please, please deliver us from the evil one, may we not end up falling away. Now, let me draw some practical lessons then. From this great request. Here is the first. We are weak. That's why we have to pray this. Satan is strong. That's why we have to pray this. God is almighty and greater than Satan and that's why we are to pray this. In the words of a great and well-known uh, hymn written by one of my fellow countrymen in Wales, a man called William Williams, the hymn is Guide Me, O you, Thou Great Jehovah. One of the verses says, I am weak, but you are mighty. Hold me with your powerful hand. Hold me with your powerful hand. And he can because the Bible says greater is he within us, that is within those who truly trust Jesus, than he that is in the world, that is the devil and those whom he will use. Or again, if God be for us, who can be against us? So the one who is for us is greater than the one against us. The one who is in us is greater than the devil. Secondly, and here I want to answer that question, uh, do I believe that a Christian can lose his salvation? Secondly, although we are kept by the power of God, we are kept by the power of God, the Bible says, through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, God doesn't keep us independently of our faith. He uses our faith to keep us. 
So we've got to be very, very wary that we don't fall into the trap of holding to a teaching which the Bible most certainly does not teach, which is this. Oh, well, I'm saved. I, I made a commitment to Jesus 20 years ago. I, I, don't, live very, I don't live a very careful life now. I, I, I'm not exercising faith in Jesus, but I will save them so I can't lose my salvation. That is not the teaching of the Bible. The teaching of the Bible is what Christians used to refer to as the final perseverance of the saints. It's not I was saved then in the past, that it doesn't matter what happens in between, uh, now and, and the, the very end of everything, I, I'll be all right then. No, no, the teaching of the Bible is you were saved then if you were really saved, truly saved. God holds you, God keeps you, but the means that he used to keep you is that you keep exercising faith in Jesus Christ and that is why this prayer is very very important lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil don't O oh Lord cause us not to fall away in other words if we really believe in this doctrine this teaching that if you were once saved you can't lose your salvation it means we believe in the final perseverance of the saints and for that faith to, 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 to grow we have to be prayerful we have to exercise faith and we have to ask the Lord to strengthen our faith in other words rightly believing that teaching doesn't make you careless it has the opposite effect and you see it's at that point that the difference between the true Christian and the person who professes but is never really saved, it's at that point that this difference becomes apparent. Because the person who professes doesn't persevere. He may go on for, for quite some time, but he doesn't persevere. The true Christian, he may have many bumps along the road, he may have many falls along the road, but though he falls, he rises again. Because he is kept by the power of God through faith, and he keeps renewing his actings of faith upon Jesus Christ. The third thing is, of course, and this is so important, although we are kept by the power of God through faith, it's not our faith that keeps us, it's the power of God. Faith is that which then looks to Christ. It's not so much the strength of our faith, but the object of our faith. So we are praying to our Heavenly Father, but we can only come to our Heavenly Father, as Jesus Christ says elsewhere, through Him. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's through him, it's, it's through him, by the Spirit, that we have access to the Father, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2. And so you see, the vital thing is to keep looking to Jesus. Not to be trusting ourselves, but to be trusting in the Lord. We, we've got a battle on our hands, we've got a fight. That's normal Christian experience. It is normal to face testings and trials. It is normal to be tempted by the devil. But that being so, it is essential that we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So let me conclude, and this will probably be the shortest Sunday sermon I've ever preached as the last one. And some may, uh, may think, well, they wish it was the other way around, and I'd started off like this and continued. But I'm drawing to a conclusion. So let me conclude with a few thoughts of application. First of all, pray this every day. Pray it every day. Pray for yourself. How are you going to persevere? By saying, I am weak, but you are strong. Hold me, keep me, Jesus, all day long. Pray it for yourself. Pray it for your brothers and sisters. Can I address our church, particularly at this point, although this message is going out for all and sundry, um, as I'm due now to retire shortly, pray for one another. He loves me most, said the great saintly Robert Murray McChain, a Scottish Christian of the 19th century. He loves me most who prays for me most. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for those in the church. Pray for brothers and sisters you've never met in other parts of the world. Pray for them. What are you to pray? Pray, lead us not into temptation. Some of your brothers and sisters are going through great trials. Pray for them that they'll be kept. Pray for them that they won't succumb to the devil and give in to sin. Pray. Pray for your brothers and sisters. What about brothers and sisters in Syria? What about out there in um, 
parts of the world where they're being severely persecuted. Pray for them. Sometimes Christians say, oh, I don't know what to pray for. There's just so much to pray for. Pray for yourself. Pray for one another. But also pray, but deliver us from evil. Pray that for yourself. You may have succumbed. The devil may have pulled you down. Pray, deliver me from the evil one. He can do it, you know. Oh, again and again we read in the Bible sometimes of God's people who through their folly returned to sin and then they woke up to the folly of what they had done and they were desperate but they cried unto the Lord in their distress and he heard them and he delivered them remember Jesus Christ didn't come into the world to condemn sinners he didn't do that because we were condemned already he came into the world to save sinners and having saved sinners, though he disciplines us, though he corrects us, he doesn't then say, well, I, I've saved you, but now I'm going to condemn you for a few weeks and a few months because you haven't been doing very well. No, no. His business, if I can put it like that, his great work is to save, not just bring us into his family, into his kingdom, but to bring us finally into his presence. So cry out to him. If, if you've succumbed to temptation, cry out to him. But oh, not only for yourself, but for your brothers and sisters. Have you seen a brother or sister who's overtaken in a fault? Have you seen a brother or sister who's sort of gone off the rails? How do you respond? Well, the very first thing is, is to pray for them. Listen to these great words in the first letter of John in chapter 5. If anyone sees his brother, that means brother or sister, commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and life will be given him. Now, John doesn't spell out what the sin unto death is. But we can say this, that we read in the Bible of God's people who committed some pretty terrible sins at times and they were not the sin unto death. They were not the sin unto death. It seems to me that the, one of the things that verse is referring to, not the only thing, is that we're not to pray for people who've died. But we are to pray. If we see someone who has fallen into sin, pray for them. Don't write them off. Don't condemn them. Have pity on them. Realise that you could be in the same position. Take heed lest you fall, says the Bible. Pray for them. Have compassion upon them. And oh, if I can come back here to our own church. Are you someone who's been really slipping? We've not seen much of you. I'll be moving on. But of course, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Might this not be a great opportunity to pray, Oh Lord, I've been bumping along. I've not really been looking to you. Forgive me. Forgive me my sins. And now, Oh Lord, deliver me from the evil one. He will deliver his people. Every one of his people will get safe home to glory. Some will arrive in the full sail of faith. Some will arrive with the rigging of their boat damaged. But they'll get there in the end. Why? How? The true saint, the true disciple perseveres to the end for this reason. That he's got a persevering saviour. He'll overcome the devil because through faith in Jesus he's joined to the one who did overcome the devil. He triumphed over him when the devil tempted him for 40 days in the wilderness. He triumphed over him supremely in his death and resurrection. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is victor. None perish who trust him. Let that be written on your heart now and forevermore. Amen. I'm going to pray. O oh Lord, we thank you that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. And now, O oh Lord, we pray that you will write the truth we've been considering upon our hearts and bless it to us for your great name's sake. Amen. I do hope you'll join again next week when there'll be, I'm not sure who is preaching, but someone will be bringing the message of God's word 
So it would be good for you to join uh, this uh, YouTube uh, uh, message again next week. Until then, may God bless you richly. And to the Church at Free School Court, may God be with you until we meet again. Be that in heaven. Amen. Goodbye.